In the meeting today, we have people who are writing for the first time and who are going through the process of, um, of really imagining characters and, and style and so forth and so on um, for the first time today. So I think it's really trying to create this balance um, of those of us who are award-winning writers and those that are just beginning and to really work together to generate something that is absolutely spectacular, especially at this time that we are celebrating the, um, the Nobel Prize um, for, for literature coming from, from Africa. I think that uh, it's a good time to start um, our meeting. So let me start by introducing myself. Um, so I am uh, Kimani Njogu. I am a writer um, as well as um, an academic, uh, but I also work very closely on issues of land governance um, on the continent. So um, we have writers from across Africa, uh, some established, others just emerging, um, and, and, and so on in the room. And we will be meeting um, to not only appreciate the, the role of uh, land in our creativity, but also to um, share amongst ourselves some of the, some of the skills that go towards making um, a good story. Uh, so the first uh, set of um, sharing will be given by Dr. Joan Kagwanja, who is based uh, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, she is the chief uh, in agriculture and business enabling environment, and also the coordinator of the African Land Policy Center um, uh, in, 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 in Ethiopia, uh, which is really uh, an organ of the African Union. Um, she does quite a bit of work on matters of land, and she's also um, a not yet self-declared writer. So I think this is uh, an opportunity for uh, more intensity of uh, her, her coming out as a writer, uh, although she's a land economist. Dr. Joanne Kagwanja will make um, the welcoming remarks. Um, and then after she has done her piece, we will be engaging with one of the uh, foremost writers um, from the continent in terms of, you know, really um, engaging with issues of land, Dr. Peter uh, Kimani, uh, who is also a lecturer um, and professor of creativity. Um, so we now want to invite uh, Dr. Joan Kagwanja to step in uh, to make her remarks and then um, really have a sharing with all of us. Dr. Kagwanja, please. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Kimani. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, and the reason I don't have any books behind me is because I'm not a writer. Um, so the blank, um, I'm hoping that by the end of this course, uh, the, the white uh, wall behind me will be uh, a shelf of books. And, and so <laughs> I, I want to thank you for, um, for organizing this, for co-organizing this with us. And I want to welcome everybody to this course. My name is Joanne Kagwanja. I am the coordinator of the Africa Land Policy Center, and um, I also have a role in, in leading work on agriculture and business enabling environment. First, let me just, on behalf of the Africa Union Commission, the Economic Commission for Africa and the Africa Development Bank, I invite uh, you all in this, our first uh, event of the conference on, Af on land policy in Africa. As you know, or you might know, this is, uh, we've had uh, now three sessions, and this is our fourth one uh, editions. And we've had uh, very interesting themes, but not as interesting as this one, I would say. Uh, we've looked at issues of agriculture. We've is looked at issues uh, pertaining to corruption. I've been able to very well articulate the linkages between land and those issues. But stepping back a little bit to who we are, so that we see why this theme is so important to us. Uh, in 2006, uh, the Africa Union Commission, the Economic Commission for Africa and the Africa Development Bank 
came together uh, because we recognized that land was being land governance was being spoken about uh, by others, especially on uh, outside of Africa, and that Africans did not have a voice, a united voice, uh, to speak about land governance in terms of an ownership of an agenda. And so it was very important that we generated knowledge that would lead to an agenda where we would say, this is who we are, and this is how we want to manage, this is how we should have been managing our, our land, this is how we want to better do it, this is how we are going to do it, and we are inviting others to join us to do that. And so the land policy initiative came to being in 2006. And uh, since then, we've had quite some successes in terms of uh, raising awareness of the issue, but also garnering political will, where we've had at the AU summit level, a declaration on land that has committed heads of states to lead land policy processes, but also to enhance human capacities and institutions uh, that pertain to land, but specifically to address issues that pertain to uh, the rights of, of land by for women, because that across the board seems to be a challenge. Uh, institutions, institutional capacity seems to be a challenge and a few other issues were identified, especially in our uh, core documents, the framework and guidelines on land policy in Africa. And uh, since then, we've then decided that there are certain platforms that need to be established in order for us to make enough noise around, around the issues, but also as a basis for bringing everybody on board. And so the Conference on Land Policy in Africa was one where we said, look, African scholars, African scientists, uh, they do publish out there on land governance issues, uh, but they don't publish somewhere on the continent in a united way. And we wanted to make sure that uh, A, we had a journal and we do have one now, and B, we also uh, have this platform where we meet every two years. And it's not just for scientists, it's for persons uh, that uh, like yourselves, like myself, who are practitioners, but also writers and others, uh, journalists, um, but also uh, our traditional authorities and us, others who come to this space. And so uh, this year, uh, with the theme that we have, because in line with the AU theme, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging one for, for those of us who are economists, obviously. And so we brought on board excellent, excellent, excellent people to help us out here. And then there is yourselves who are all uh, very, uh, many of you well-renowned writers who maybe you didn't know it, but you write a lot about land uh, in, the, in your writings and you are connected uh, to us that way. And we would like to connect a little bit better on that. So the invitation uh, comes from the mother institutions uh, to start this conference with this particular uh, masterclass which I am so happy that Professor Kemani, who is a long-standing uh, advisor for us, uh, is able to help to put together. So, uh, so we we normally have this picture, which um, we put together with Yubea at the beginning in 2006. I think it's not always that, that it's not always correct, but it's it, for us. It it just reminds us that we are dealing with a complex issue. Land. It's multifaceted and it is inclusive inclusive of all, all of us so for instance when i read what you write i see land all of you and sometimes it's represented in one of these boxes maybe not in the more uh boring ones like financial resources for instance but a lot of it i hear coming either from the area where we are talking about some of the consequences of what happens uh, when you don't manage land well or when you manage it well. Uh, so I'll hear us talking about stories. Um, my own story with land and why I do land comes from a lady who was a, a, friend, a woman who was a friend of my mother's. Her name is Wagatoria. So if you ask me, where is your connection? I mean, where did you come at this? I know Wagatoria. I know that she was killed by her son. I know that it was because of land. Uh, and I know that it had to do with her having been married somewhere else and not claiming, not claiming land because she was a woman and her having to come back home where the brothers uh, in, you know, included her and showed her a place where she could farm. And she started to put herself 
a, a small piece or a, a house and started putting iron sheets together. I remember this because she was very close to us. And one day she gets this piece of land and the son has a family and decides, I want this piece of land. And the next thing we know, we are burying Wagatobia. So for me, it's a personal story. I think for us, it's a very personal story when it comes to land. So what I'm speaking about, you'll find it in the consequences, for instance, in terms of access. You'll find it in where I put cultural origins, in terms of discrimination, I say, of women. Uh, but when it comes to culture and heritage, um, we are surrounded there. So we have our own cultural practices, which determine how we interact with the land in terms of the cultural practices that we have. We know that they are on the land. We know they are based on land. We know that when I have my locks, uh, for some of us, we put, we put uh, soil or clay on our, on our locks. Uh, we know that it's ceremonial in terms of the way that we look, the way that we decorate ourselves. But that we also have, um, we also have our, our, our politics around the issue of land and who owns it, who doesn't, who, who, can, who, can, who can allocate it, uh, who can be given land, who cannot. Uh, who can be included in conversations around land. And the fact that if you look at most people in political power, they would want to amass land, they would want to own some land. It's our identity, it's cultural, it's spiritual. And so at the Land Policy Initiative, uh, for us, land is all those issues. It's about the, our spiritual, our cultural, our, our, our economic, uh, the basis for our economic growth and our economic uh, livelihood. It's also about how we interact with each other, but how also we conserve that which is important to us, including land, water, and other resources. But, but when we look at our cultural practices as well, we do, see, we do see practices that could be discriminatory, and especially as land is becoming scarce, uh, and, and as, especially because of urbanization, because of, of commercialization, because of so many other things where if you didn't need to secure your land then, because your neighbors knew, knew who you are, um, that you do need now, because your neighbors could be the very ones who are invading in your land, especially as it becomes smaller or they see value in land and start selling it. So the issues of documentation of land become extremely important, for instance. So when you are not secure, uh, before we were secure because your neighbors knew who you are, and it was important that all of us take care of each other. But as that changes, and I know you write about this all the time, that as it changes, it means that we have to look at land differently and how we secure it differently. And that's how we even look at the fact that our land, the majority of it is managed uh, in traditional systems, traditional systems that have been sort of invaded or interacted with our colonial legacy, colonial systems, and they influenced how we manage the land or how we recognize the systems through which land is managed. And so the less the recognition of these traditional systems in statutory law, in, in our writings, in, in government, in policy, the worse it is because these systems are still legitimate to, to the majority of our people. And so in the land policy initiative as under the AU level, uh, the first thing was to recognize that the traditional systems of government are indeed legitimate systems of government whether you like it or not, whether they are positive or negative, and that they are recognized as such by our people and they need to be recognized in the context of our laws and policy. And so the, the complexity that comes from the pluralistic nature of how we manage land is one that, is one that we, 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 we are trying to recognize in the written law, for instance. But then we also look at the fact that when we came out of, you know, we fought, when we fought for independence, we were fighting for land, mainly because land had been taken away, communities had been moved around, they had been displaced. That means you were displacing people's spirituality in a way, their culture, their economic well-being, their political well-being, you were displacing that in some ways and changing it and shaking it around. And then there was a formation of new kinds of arrangements with that regard. And so when we look at then what did we do as African states post-independence? We didn't do that well because we did not really uh, recognize uh, that the land that we fought for, we fought for for the people, for our people, and we started seeing a creeping in of, of elites capturing land uh, and many, many other aspects of poor land governance 
that then led to disenfranchised communities and a lot of that. So when we came at it, we said, what can we do? Where is our entry point? And our entry point is one where we are looking at our policies, our legislation again, and how it represents the specificities of what Africa is, but also looking at how responsive the systems of administration are. In places where you have the traditional governance, how prominent is it in facilitating good access to land? And how can we bring into, you know, start bringing the changes that need to be made with our traditional authorities, particularly for us through the Forum for Africa Traditional Authorities, so that some of the practices which are negative can, not, can, can be diminished or so that we can have, for instance, access to land uh, by women and other people being brought on the table to discuss issues of land, pastoralists and, and people and, and youth and others. So this is what we do at the Land Policy Initiative in terms of ensuring that we have the right knowledge, we have the right tools, uh, we, have, we, we drive ourselves towards committing to do uh, what is right in terms of land governance, but also looking for the capacities and partnerships that bring the capacities that we need, reforming curriculum so that it is decolonized, so that it is, it is, it is up to date in terms of what is good, what, what, what represents what Africa is, and the governance systems that we have so that a surveyor who is trained in Germany or in, in South Africa, of, of most of the times is actually the same curriculum. And so we are looking at how do you change that curriculum so that it speaks to the systems that Africa are. So you don't go to the traditional lands and start drawing lines and then you get killed in the process of doing that as a surveyor, for instance. So what we are saying is how do the stories that are coming out of the continent then are uh, relating to land and, and, and I think they do relate to land, but what I read, a lot of it, again, comes at it from, 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 the, from the sadness, from the joys, uh, and from many, many uh, issues that pertain to how we, our culture, our spirit, our politics, our, the, the, the economic aspects of what we do, that which we do, how we farm, how we take care of our animals, how that relates to, 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 to land, and the stories that come out of that, uh, those that we hear, whether it is issues of conflict, uh, issues of um, you know urban development and and living in the slums and coming out of those slums and 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 either um, you know just succeeding or not succeeding or whatever it is, whether it is issues of corruption. I just wanted to say that you will find yourselves and the stories that you write most probably in some of these boxes, and hopefully, hopefully, this conference is going to help us to tie the box, to tie the dots, and also bring to the attention of policymakers, bring to the attention of those that uh, have the power to start making changes. And especially to facilitate the arts and, 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 and to, to recognize that our culture is indeed and can be the basis for uh, socioeconomic development, for the basis through which we address issues of, of climate change and, and conserving our resources, uh, issues of ensuring that we don't leave communities behind and that our land is actually benefiting our communities today, but also, also in the long term, in terms of looking at communities beyond uh, today, this century, but also the next. Kemani, if I can stop here, uh, because I want to listen more than anything, uh, mine is really to, to say I'm thrilled to be part of the course. And, and, and I will remove the heart of coordinator and now become a student and start learning from everybody else. Uh, welcome everyone. And I hope we can reflect and, uh, and learn. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanne, uh, for bringing in um, you know, very rich ideas uh, into this creative uh, space. Um, I really liked the, you know, your reference to the colonial period uh, and the post-colonial period and the ways in which decisions that are made uh, affect communities. And the person who is going to guide us into that terrain of creativity is Dr. Peter Kimani. And I must confess that he is not a relative of mine. We are not related. Uh, we met uh, uh, most recently uh as adults as writers um, um and, and 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 dr peter uh kimani uh, is an author of the dance of the jacaranda which is a new york's 
uh, New York Times Notable Book of the Year, and also editor of Nairobi Noah. Uh, he is a leading African writer of his generation. Uh, he has published three novels, uh, including Dance of the Jacaranda, uh, and quite a few other, you know, um, um, writings you know, beyond beyond the novels. I must say, uh, he has taught at the University of Amherst uh, and the University of Houston in the United States. He chaired the 2019 Kane Prize for African Writing, which is the content's preeminent literary prize and mentorship program. And his latest effort, Nairobi Noah, which was released in 2020, is a short story anthology featuring generations of, of writers. Um, let me also say that he's a professor of practice at the Aga Khan University and, um, and has really been teaching creative writing uh, globally. So it's a privilege to have uh, Dr. Peter Kimani with us today to take us through the craft of, um, of writing. Um, and I must also say that um, in the most recent months, he has also worked with writers from across the continent on writing sustainable development goals creatively. So, so the, really this is a continuation of this level of uh, engagement and so, um, you know, really welcome and take us through this craft of the imagination. Uh, and now the ball is in your court, Mwalimu. Thank you very much for your kind words and Joanne for your very rich introduction. And uh, good to see a few old uh, faces from the other, the other project. So um, I think this is what it means to have a, a community of writers. Uh, because we write in isolation, um, we, we, we desire and deserve communion with fellow writers. So that can make the task ahead daunting, just imagining <laughs> all, these, all, these, all these big, uh, big, big brains with lots of skills in different areas <clears throat> aspire to, to learn. We're going to start by deconstructing those two pieces uh, because uh, well, while writing is impulsive, it is creative, it is also logical. So we apply mathematics. You might consider this as applied mathematics. So we go from the known to the unknown. So for us to be um, attempting to craft creative stories, effective storytelling, we must know what constitutes a good piece. Uh, so that's where I'm going to start by deconstructing those two pieces. How those two writers um, are in conversation, how those two pieces are in conversation. So having heard, having heard uh, what Joanne advised us about the context in which we can springboard our imagination to think about our communities, about families, this is a good, um, these two are very good uh, examples of um, uh, what they call Bildungsroman. So it's a German term for early development. Um, uh, we have what you call um, young, young or init initial years in life and how we envision the world. So uh, the development of the, the, young, the young writer or the young, the young um, protagonist in the story as a representation of this evolution of a community or a society. Um, but you, you don't have to worry about the technical term for now. We need to, we need to maybe unpack the stories. Maybe we'll start to just dive into down Second Avenue. And um, so today we'll go through this, uh, these two stories just to understand the mechanics of putting them together. So we unpack them first, we understand how they are put together. In my reading of this book, uh, maybe many decades ago, uh, was very, 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 very rewarding. Uh, and reading it again uh, this past uh, few, few weeks has been very refreshing. Uh, so it was published in 1959. These are the heady days of independence 
Ghana, uh, first African nation to be independent in 57. Things Fall Apart is published in 1958. Uh, and then you have, uh, and that's in West Africa. And in the South, uh, we have um, Down Second Avenue. So <clears throat> this is what we need to appreciate. The social context of a book is vital. We cannot write as though we inhabit another universe. We do actually <laughs> have the license to do that because we have science fiction, for instance, uh, and, and, and other variations of uh, imagination. But this is um, what you call realism. So it is, it, is, it is premised on an existing social condition. And what uh, Eskiam Falele is doing here is to articulate for us or, and for the world what it meant to be black in South Africa in 1959 a decade after the institutionalization of apartheid, which meant blacks, whites, and coloreds had different, uh, had different spaces, different uh, suffrage rights, different areas of residence, um, and that meant even social interactions were limited. And um, Falele writing um, uh, uh, his memoir, attempt to explain to the world what it meant to be black in South Africa in 1959. So, um, so that's very crucial because Ngoge similarly, uh, you know, his uh, book 19, published 1962, only three years after Mfalele's um, uh, memoir is equally important. So in 64, uh, he got, um, he got Whip Not Child uh, published, the first English novel from East Africa. And, uh, and you know, in 63, Kenya becomes independent. Uh, so, so again, you can see uh, the two writers are coming from similar social political conditions. South Africa is in the, the grip of apartheid. Uh, and uh, Ngoge, um, you know, we have chimes of freedom um, with, with, uh, with uh, December 1963 independence. So he's almost writing his nation into Bath uh, through writing. Mfalele is, um, you know, getting the black story, the black experience to the world after a decade of suppression. And what we know would last nearly another 40 years uh, before uh, Mandela's release uh, from prison and ultimate election to presidency. So these contexts are important. Um, and uh, what we have to, we have to now Return to uh, the brief, the brief uh, appreciation of land and uh, its intersectionality with all other facets of life is that we write as we write as creative writers. We do not write as policy makers. We don't write these as policy briefs. Uh, we write these to engage with the world, so that the issues are going to emerge, um, you know, within our writings. So, which takes us to um, that, that, that very basic question. So what comes first, the story or the message? Let's, let's get this clear. And I'll say it slowly, deliberately so, <laughs> that a message is important in a story. But the story is more important by far because it has to bear the weight of the message. I'll let that sink. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> we are writers first and foremost. We are writers, period. Our work is to share our stories with the world. How we infuse our themes and our social messages into those stories is what now requires skillful storytelling. Because when you read Down Second Avenue, when you read Whipron Child, you're not even aware that these are the issues at hand, isn't it? They emerge organically. We know Ngogi is concerned with social displacement. Mfalele is interested in social displacement, but they are not telling us this is my theme. All we see are characters, colorful characters, 
and we are invested in their pursuits. Because as humans, that's all we do for, I mean, for, for an eternity. That's all we do all our lives, sharing stories. So the moment um, you start, you start um, reading down Second Avenue, um, I have never known why. So I have never known why we, my brother, sister, and I were taken to the country when I was five. So you, you, can, you can imagine a five-year-old yourself as a five-year-old, the memory that you, you, you have, you own, you own this story. You almost um, inhabit the same universe as the narrator. You envision your own, your own journey. A five-year-old, we all were five years, <clears throat> once upon a time. So we are not even drawn to the politics of the land. We are going to see how the politics is interfused in this text. And so is Anguge's text. It is so soft and so gentle. You won't know you're being lured into the politics of South Africa, politics of dispossession, politics of apartheid. But you see how um, these policies have come to transform the fortunes of black families in Kenya and South Africa for us without anyone mentioning this was a 1948 policy that was enacted by the, uh, the regime of Jan Smuts or whoever it was in 1948 and the institutionalization of apartheid meant ABCD. We don't see any of that. We don't see any of these preachings. All you know is that we have a family that's torn asunder. Uh, we have rural urban migration because people have been forced off the land. The land can no longer support them. We see the trauma that children are, are undergoing, being shuttled from one location to the next because the family has broken down as a consequence of these policies. But these policies are not stated expressly. It is for us to, to glean we are almost eavesdropping to hear what's going on in this story because we as human beings are invested in the story of other human beings. And that's what great fiction should do. That's how great fiction works. No one is going to read um, if, 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 if uh, Google wrote about land, land adjudication in, in Kenya or or, or uh, let's even say uh, land redistribution, failures and successes. If that happened, I don't think it was going to even to be published beyond, well, now you can publish online and you can have two or three downloads. Your, sup your two supervisors, perhaps, <laughs> downloading the story. <laughs> and, at the, and at the end of your reading, that's the end of, uh, that's the end of your work. But you can have a creative work that uh, you know, circulates around the world, gets to inform the world about the less hard voices, the less known facts about our existence and our, and our conditions. So here, uh, Ngoge in his 20s, because in 64, he was barely 26, I think, um, you know, is, is, is writing what 60 years later remains a valid record of not just his own evolution as a person and as a writer, but also the evolution of a nation. So today we can review the failures and successes of land redistribution in Kenya using or filtering that through his fiction. And we can say the same of um, um, Falele, South Africa. 30 years since um, you know, multi-party democracy, how have uh, black families uh, been, uh, been reconfigured in the, new, in the new political dispensation? What, what are the dynamics that have changed? Are things better or worse? And we can use this 1959 um, uh, you know, treatise, 60, 70 years later, to illuminate that vision. So if you want to be a creative writer, think as a creative writer. So the first thing I do, and I want you to listen carefully, is to be interested in my characters. Who are these? And what's their story? Who are my characters? And what's their story? So 
through that, you're going to map out their journey. <clears throat> And, and, and it's a very logical sequencing if you think about it. Who are these characters and what's their story? Well, no one is going to uh, read a book with a blurb on the side that says, you know, uh, a decade after um, apartheid was, uh, was enforced, how have black families in, in rural uh, trans, Transvaal or whatever region of South Africa, how, how, are, they, how are they coping? Instead, we see how the characters that he narrates here are impacted by these large forces of history, how their fortunes are transformed for better and for worse. And through that journey, we come to understand uh, the, the, uh, the architecture of apartheid and its insidious way or ways in which they continue to impact society to this day. We, we're going to uh, just, uh, just pay attention to how effective uh, Eskion Falele is in, uh, in his uh, opening, opening uh, page. What's the most dramatic? What's the most vivid? What's the most effective uh, way in which he has communicated his beginning? Because the writer has to think as a fisherman. So, so you have to have your bait, you have to have your hook, you have to have your line. So we know this guy is five. And he's already uh, facing social displacement. He doesn't know why because he's too young to comprehend. But that's already a very curious uh, first line. So when you think of uh, great first lines, think of ways in, uh, in which you can hook the reader in. And even, even Falele, by opening this line the way he does, and then goes to explain to us <clears throat> uh, uh, the, the filial ties. So we know he's staying with his, uh, uh, with his uh, paternal grandmother who is not particularly kind to him. Um, we know the ear. The way those facts are, are fused together in that paragraph is what you know, compelling writing constitutes. Um, so I have never known why we, my brother, sister, and I, were taken to the country when I was five. We went to live with our grandmother, paternal grandmother. My father and mother remained in Pretoria where they both worked. My father, a shop messenger in an outfitter's farm, mother as a domestic servant. That was in the autumn of 1924. Well, Mfalela is a, uh, um, is is very very uh, very skilled in maneuvering all these what constitutes biodata, these uh, biogra biographical uh, information. But then we don't feel like we are being fed with facts because you already have the intro introduction that takes us to another time. So when he was five, and these these are the shifts in his family. But you can see the clarity with which he writes. When he says we, refers to these, uh, this trio, he and his siblings. So good writers must remember to clarify all the time. When, when you say you, uh, uh, we, who do you mean? So he is a writer of clarity, great clarity. He reminds us, it is my brother and my sister and I. And, um, but but that, that paragraph ends there uh the bio the biography that we 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 are dissecting here um we don't get to know the age of his siblings it will be revealed way into the story um and then uh, when uh, when uh, he he writes about that uh taken to the country he doesn't talk us about he he, he doesn't take us through uh the country at that moment it is in subsequent paragraphs that we hear now the location so in other words, information, do not give your readers informational overload. You drop information sparingly. As I said, when you read this story, you're almost eavesdropping to hear more about this, these characters because you're invested in their pursuits. So when you think about uh, now that, 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 that one paragraph, that is a solid introduction to some you know, nearly 250 
pages of fiction, um, there are a few things that he's doing that are important for us to learn from. One is that you do not crowd the page with characters. Do not crowd your page with characters. So uh, I, have, I, have, I have, I've read uh, you know, fiction from different uh, corners of the world and I'll find easily in a short story spanning some uh, maybe 10 pages, that's like 3,000 words, I have like 15 or 20 characters. So here, uh, the master storyteller is telling us, uh, do this sparingly. These characters are already introduced. We haven't even seen uh, the siblings at all uh, on the page, uh, even, even, even the segment that I shared with you. We haven't seen their dissection uh, further. A time will come when they're introduced. But for now, he wants to pay attention to one person at a time, which remind me the connection between filmmaking and, uh, and, and, and writing. Because when the film opens, and, and, and that's true of any film you're going to watch in any language, um, in the first uh, two minutes or so, you're going to establish uh, who are the main characters in the film. You're going to know whose story it is. Similarly, in your fiction, establish your characters properly. Uh, early on. They don't have to come um, in the first in the first few lines, but they but they have to have a bearing in the initial scenes of the book. So, um, so 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 the opening opening scene has to be absorbing, has to be engrossing, has to be captivating, and there are no ways to learn this other than practicing yourself. And we we practice by writing and rewriting. So. Uh, so that's uh, that's 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 um, something we can we can read and uh, learn from um, from Falele. What we can what we can draw from the coming uh, few pages is the use of repetition, and I think that's uh, very well applied in um, uh, on page four. Um, so so having experienced a trauma. Uh, having experienced the trauma of this granny separation from his own parents, we see uh, the narrator uh, finding solace uh, from animals. So that's on page four where the parents have, have, have bought goats. And, um, you know, goats appear to be expressing more compassion towards, uh, towards a little boy and uh, any siblings. So in a way, teasing out the brutality of the humans uh, through this very, very gentle gesture. So, um, so, so in other words, what uh, Mfalele is doing, he's showing us, he's not telling us. And that's a very, a very good skill for a writer to, to possess. We, we, tend to, we, we tend to talk about these things, to preach about uh, what we are or our characters are pursuing. But here, it is a simple gesture uh, that seems to me uh, very, very powerful. Uh, that uh, it is a goat that seems to be in solidarity with this terrified little boy. So gestures are more powerful than actually writing this to say this is how her personality is or was. But seeing these uh, actions uh, meted out on this little boy. So I wanted to point out to one other one other important aspect of that. Um, uh, that segment is that on page 10, uh, we see another flashback. So started with, um, started with uh, age five, now he's at age 13. Uh, so on page 10, he's already uh, swiftly moved to, 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 pay, to, to, to age 13. So I wanted to point out to uh, the fluid, the fluid movement of time uh, in um, down Second Avenue, and it works almost seamlessly. And you have to remind yourself constantly <laughs> where where is the reader at, uh, because on page ten, looking back to those thirteen, to those fa first thirteen years of my life, um, so we know we started at at uh, at five. Now he's at thirteen, 
And uh, by the time we get to, I think, page uh, 15, uh, now he's at, um, at age 12. So it's true when you have a short, um, uh, let's say, story arc or sh short narrative arc, you do not need to uh, complicate the story by shifting back and forth because you need to understand where we are at. And even when you do, find concrete signals to remind the reader that uh, this is where I am at. And um, Falele is very good at that. He's reminding us his, his own evolution as well as um, the, chrono the chronology of his own life. But 13 comes before 12. So you can, you can make your story uh, fluid and uh, you know, less restricted by time because if you're constantly uh, aware where you're at all the time, they're going to have a very easy task navigating uh, a time. So Mfalele very skillfully uh, sets, this, uh, sets um, the mood even before this tragic moment happens. And um, uh, we're told it's Sunday morning, that's on page 20, somewhere in the middle. Uh, and the kids are lounging in their blankets, um, just trying to summon their energies to rise. And there, um, we're told even the clouds, you know, appear gloomy. And uh, so, so he's setting the mood by utilizing all the elements available to him. There is a drama that's await, that awaits in his own uh, household. Uh, there is a building tension in this, in this family. Uh, he incorporates nature into this, into this set. And then you have the moment. So, uh, so just before... Um, uh, before the father, you know, comes into the room, um, we have these these twelve appearing softly in a corner. We are given specific, concrete, specific details. It's a primus stove. It's purring softly, and there is some some pot steaming. Uh, the enticing smell, enticing smell of meat, potatoes, and curry. And then, uh, after this description, we go back. We flash back now to the village. So he's utilizing uh, all his, um, you know, memory to capture this dramatic moment before, you know, the unth unthinkable happens. Cumulatively, uh, one can say in this very uh, brief introduction to Eskim Falele's fiction, we've come to appreciate the disintegration of South African society as manifest in this particular family the narrator skillfully navigating between ages five and 13 to recall the traumatic experiences that informed the larger forces of, uh, of history that appeared to bear pressure on his own life, his immediate family, and the larger society in South Africa. And that's what great fiction does. It informs us, educates us, and also entertains us. And, 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 and what's remarkable about uh, those two texts is how they speak to each other, that um, you have, you have um, this young, young, young star going to school uh, for the first time, and um, we see the trauma of uh, uh, colonization in this, in this part of the world. Uh, the father is uh, a tenant living off uh, another an, another African another Kenyan family uh, land, but uh, through the story we get to know that the land even that's you know owned by this um, uh, British settler, uh, you know once upon a time belonged to this uh, uh, community and this family directly, and uh, the moments in which um, uh, this man is standing that that is Njoroge, the main uh, protagonist. The moment the father is going through the motion, stealing the land, uh, almost fondling the soil, and uh, he is invested in, in, in its future because spiritually he's connected to the history of the land. It's also a means of uh, you know, economic uh, productivity. Uh, so the immediate economic as well as social and spiritual connections to the land. Um, but you don't see, we don't see land as an overbearing feature in the story. It is a story of this young man navigating life and coming of age at a time of great turbulence in his, in his society. 
So when you read, it is um, the, 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 the burgeoning relationship between Njoroge and Muihaki. Um, you see him trying to navigate uh, this very complex terrain because these large forces of history uh, have disintegrated his family and the larger community. But it is not an overbearing fact. It is foregrounded. So it is a human story that we are invested in. It is a human pursuit that you're invested in. And that's what cumulatively drives us to appreciate the story. Although it's about dispossession, social, cultural dispossession, as well as economic dispossession, uh, one can say it's the same forces that are pushing the villagers in, in South Africa away from the village to go look for you know, uh, paid work. Same way that uh, this man, Ngodo, uh, who is Njoroge's father, is trying to make a living um, under the household of the Howlands, uh, the, the British settler, but also aware of the history of um, you know, dispossession because the farm that he's employed to work today and get, get paid uh, once upon a time belonged to his, to his clan. And uh, he has these uh, delusions about being um, you know, compensated and finally accessing the land and taking charge of it. So very interesting, um, you know, two, two visions of, uh, of the land, one from the south, the other from the east, using children memory, children's memory to recall uh, uh, these struggles and how they inform what has happened today in Kenya and South Africa as a mirror of the, the fictions that have been created by these two great writers. In Nairobi, uh, most evenings, especially on, 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 on weekends, friends are likely to call each other and ask, what's the plot? I don't know if uh, people say that in Lagos, in Harare, <laughs> in, in, uh, in uh, Addis Ababa, uh, in Ohio, I'm sure when you say, what's the plot? You're being invited to share the plans for the evening. So they're asking, what's, uh, what, what are your plans for the evening? So uh, in storytelling, uh, when somebody asks, uh, what's the plot uh, in, in a story? They're simply asking, what's the crux of the story? What's the story about, essentially? So we need to articulate that vision very, very simply, very clearly, from the first sentence we write in our short stories. And as Kiam Falele does it um, you know, remarkably well, I have never known why we, my brother, sister, and I, were taken to the country when I was five. So we know from that uh, sentence, direct, simple, precise as it is, it's an invitation to complex family dynamics. It is a five-year-old remembering this journey uh, from the township to the village and back and forth. So we know it's going to be um, a revelation. I have never known. So if he doesn't know, one, uh, the reader is, is intrigued. Then if he doesn't know, who knows? <laughs> that's, that's simply the hook that Mfalele is utilizing here. I have never known. So it's an invitation to eavesdrop in here what are these complex family dynamics that this five-year-old is remembering? And for him to be writing as an adult, recalling this childhood, it must be an important phase of his development. So I have never known um, is a hook that uh, Mfalele is throwing at us. So the plot here we know will be about family, a complex family situation. Um, we, we, we know, uh, you know, by the time you finish that paragraph, that he's been taken to live with his uh, grandparents. So ordinarily, we know it's parents who raise their children, where grandparents are raising um, uh, their grandchildren. We know that's a dysfunctional society, a dysfunctional, dysfunctional family. So the plot here, just by even, even without going to the uh, book blab, we know it's going to be a revelation about a difficult childhood navigated in different, in, in different situations in a difficult environment in South Africa as it comes to pass. So uh, Ngoge's story, the story premise is equally simple. 
It's about a young man going to school um, in the shadow of war in colonial Kenya. So the land issue, of course, is at the heart of uh, colonial settlement, because when you read, you're going to find this is a community you know, pushed to, uh, to the periphery to make way for the white settlement or what they call the white islands. If you're writing about, um, you know, six pages, uh, short story, what would be a good number of uh, characters to have? Characters are, you know, the engine of the story. They move the story for you. We, we can have as many characters as 10, but one has to ask, what are they doing on the page? What's their role? And uh, if, if someone is performing a role that can be performed by somebody else, uh, can you have this one individual perform multiple tasks on the page so that you don't have a crowding of uh, characters? So that's a very, that's a very important uh, aspect uh, for us to know. But then um, they, do, they need not perform equal or um, similar important roles of equal importance. So, so in other words, you have to have your main character or main characters. In a short story, I think you cannot have too many main characters, otherwise it's going to be confusing. Um, uh, who, do we, who do we get invested in? So you have to be very judicious. Who is the main character? And, and, and I think this is where uh, uh, films uh, teach us a very simple but important role that uh, when you watch a film within a few, a few seconds, you really get a sense who is going to be the main, the main, the main star of the film. So when you have a, a large cast of five or six, or even say three characters uh, with equal roles or similar roles on the page, we might not be able to tell immediately whose story it is. Uh, so you're going to know uh, from your own, from your own um, uh, uh, material who is going to be the best to drive your story. So, of course, uh, you know, you have a plot line, you have characters, then you have to think about how do I get the story going. Uh, so the story has three basic uh, story elements. Uh, the first one is the, the beginning. Uh, and the beginning in, in a short story lasting about uh, six pages, you cannot, uh, you cannot um, stretch it too much. Um, in a novel, you can afford to have an introduction that lasts a page or even two, but, but nothing more than half a page uh, should constitute a good solid beginning of a short story. If you stretch that to beyond a page, that's nearly 20% of uh, uh, your space is already taken up by the introduction. So you have to be uh, quick and efficient in your beginnings. Then the second part will be the body of uh, your story. And this is where now you articulate the key issues in the story. That's where we see the evolution of the characters. So if, they are, if the character starts uh, at a certain point of their evolution, they have to grow within the story. They have to grow within the page. So if somebody starts uh, like uh, that mean-spirited um, uh, grandmother that you read in uh, Down Second Avenue, we, we expect um, some evolution of, of her personality. Maybe, um, you know, we'll be coming to, you know, different ways of uh, resolving those tensions, uh, but uh, she cannot remain static, mean and smiling, uh, occasionally indifferent to the needs and aspirations of these, uh, these, uh, these youngsters, we need to see her evolve within the page. We, we expect some growth and evolution. Same way we say people are changed by the circumstances, they cannot remain static. Uh, and that's what a good body of a short story uh, should do. And then we have the final part, uh, which is uh, the ending. But what good endings must do is to actually uh, end the story. <laughs> so, so there are the many ways of ending the story. And one uh, is also uh, potentially resolving uh, central uh, conflicts um, in the story or the major elements that, that are at odds with the characters. Um, and that could mean people coming to terms with the circumstances. Uh, it could mean 
um, people having a change of heart. Maybe it's a very, um, you know, brutal human being like that granny in down second Avenue. Um, maybe, you know, changing her ways and uh, perhaps you can say getting redeemed, uh, you know, her, her life and her, and, and her personality becoming less, um, less dangerous to these young words. And um, it could be perhaps uh, people just conceding that that's just the way of, uh, of, of life and living with those circumstances. So there are multiple ways of ending the story. And, uh, but crucially, uh, actually, we need to leave the reader something to think, something to ponder. It's not necessarily that they're asking for more. Well, they do ask for more in that sense because they have continued the story in their, in their own processes. They're they are thinking through the issues and they are, and they are motivated to consider other possibilities. Um, so, so good, good uh, stories leave us with some food for thought. Uh, so, so when the story ends, um, there will be some culmination of uh, you know, conclusion, but also leaving the reader something to think through and to perhaps appreciate that there is a, a, an important lesson the story was trying to, to teach or to communicate, uh, but you have to end the stories. So, um, well, that said, I have to uh, tell you, there are some stories that have evolved into bigger, you know, works of uh, fiction. Um, uh, I, know, I know quite a few novels that came from short stories. Chimamanda's um, Half of Ayolo San, uh, evolved from a short story and she went back to the story and found there are so many things I need to know in this story. And then she expanded that uh, in a few years. Uh, she had one of uh, maybe the best uh, work that she has produced. So they can be a beginning of something bigger, but for the reader who is reading and immersed in this moment, they need to get to finally comprehend this, this story has ended. Um, which is to say, <clears throat> Uh, coming, coming to, uh, coming to the craft of uh, the story, we have to know our stuff very, very well. Just, um, um, just uh, beginning a sentence, we know that should be a signal to what the story shall be about. Um, so, and then we have to be more spare. We have to be more economical uh, with our words because we have a lot to say in very restricted space and time. You can go back and forth within, um, you know, the story, as long as you are signaling to the reader all the time where you're at, so that there is no confusion of the fluidity of the time and its motions. What I want us to acknowledge, even, even, even as we go forward, is to know that the process that you are trying to create here can be replicated in different contexts on the continent. It could be the Laikipia in the Rift Valley of Kenya, it could be the, the Fulani and, uh, and, uh, and other disparate communities in Nigeria, could be in Central Africa, could be in Southern Africa. So what you're trying to do here is to learn how to apply these methods. So the concepts that you're going to develop here can be applied in different contexts of the continent and where land issues are concerned. We have to endear our readers to derive sympathy or to express sympathy towards our, uh, our, our uh, towards our, our our characters if we if we frame them to highlight their humanity. Uh, so, in other words, even villains and um, there are many of them in this continent. Even villains uh, have their humanity, and I think that's actually a good point for us to ponder. Uh, so that's 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 a good moment to uh, to to get him uh, to be appreciated by the reader as a human being in spite of everything, because empathy is the lifeblood of fiction. If our readers are not invested in our work, if they cannot share in the aspiration of our characters, we are we are fighting a losing battle. We have to endear our readers to uh, engender sympathy towards our characters. And I'll give you an example of some texts that I know we've read. Uh, Things Fall Apart, for instance, where this Okonko, a bully, uh, you know, in his household, uh, we know he works, uh, you know, he's obsessed with success, uh, at times rash and unreasonable, but 
we see, um, you know, how he reacts towards Ezinma, uh, the girl that uh, he really doted on. And even when uh, Okonko, uh, you know, with all his excesses, uh, when Ezinma is unwell, uh, who do we see? He wakes in the middle of the night to take Ezinma to, uh, to, to, to that priestess, uh, to go and seek intervention. So, or, uh, you know, Okonko's own persona, this forceful character, you know, like a force of nature, um, he, he finds, uh, in spite of his uh, success, his, his anxieties in life, this one moment, this one life, you know, is the one that refines his humanity. And we see Okonko, the human being. So there's a caveat to everyone. Land is a very emotive issue in every part of the world, particularly so in this country. I mean, in this continent, no matter where we are on the continent, we are, we are, we are, um, we are victims. We have been victims of land dispossession for more than 100 years. So, um, what what you need to do is that in creating uh, your narrative, be aware of the political language and how that can shade your story, uh, even inadvertently. Uh, and um, if our, our intention is to shape and shift land policy on the continent, we have to give our, our, our readers a chance to separate the wheat and the chaff and to locate truth where it resides. And that can only be revealed by uh, you know, compelling characters that are believable and whose, investment, whose, whose pursuits we are invested in. So if you had now, uh, if you had another dynamic that uh, requires a further elaboration of, of, of this Kariba course or Kariba cast, um, the, the frame, the story frame becomes overbearing. It's going to collapse because the reader will be trying to comprehend. So where is this story going? I thought it was about land, uh, you know, um, uh, dispossession or, uh, you know, land invasion, whatever you call it. And now we have another, we, we're entering another realm. We're now going to the, into the metaphysics. We, we, are, we are going now to a psychology of the person. So the story tangent might uh, shift completely if you crowd too much uh, information in one short story. Because we have to remember we have a limited uh, you know, space, six, uh, seven pages. And if um, the plot is way too complex, then it's going to, we're going to outrun our space. And then we'll be left with lingering issues that are unresolved. So we need to keep our, our, our plot lines precise, not simple, but precise. Uh, and they're going to unfurl in their complexity as we go. So, so the body of the story has to pack a lot of information. Um, and um, because we've been set to a certain expectation in the opening of the story, the story must be uh, a reflective look on the past. Our stories need to capture these complexities and our characters are best placed to communicate this. If we, if, if we do anything else, um, slide towards um, you know, political correctness and terminologies that speak to that, we are going to be joining a different kind of writing. And ours is the creative realm. We imagine the possibilities for our people um, and their welfare. So land rights in this continent um, have maintained that trajectory, whether you're talking of east, south, north, central, all parts of the continent. We have not had a proper re restoration of land rights uh, to those who are dispossessed at the onset of colonization in 1880s. So 150 years later, we are still wrestling with the same issues. So what uh, Ngoge and um, Mfalele are teaching us, we have to find a vehicle that moves our story forward. So it is a pursuit of education in the case of Ngoge's um, group of child, this youngster navigating teenage uh, in the shadow of uh, the liberation struggle, and we see how his uh, family fortunes are impacted upon by this moment. So it's a traumatic experience. And, and, and through um, him journeying through school and home, we see how he, how he tenderly moves, uh, not just developing uh, physically and mentally, but also growing awareness of this history of this possession. Similarly, Mfalele moves uh, from uh, Pretoria to the slums and back 
in, in pharmaceutical education, in a restricting uh, environment, uh, apartheid is in place. And through uh, these shifts of a child growing and coming of age, we also see the growing, the growing pains of the nation that is South Africa. And uh, in a sense, uh, to this day, we can use his lenses to filter the present day challenges of South Africa. Uh, the black-white divide is still in place. You might, you might be free now to move from one, one, one corner of uh, the country to the other without requiring um, uh, an ID, which also happened in colonial Kenya. But Mfalela is showing us we have replaced one form of oppression with another. Now that people can move freely, uh, what about economic disparities? They are still in place. And land, remember the chief is the one who has access to land and can choose whom to, whom to grant. Um, um, Falele's fiction 60 years later, or maybe, yeah, 60 years later, is as valid and relevant as it was when it was first enacted. So this is what good fiction does. Uh, writers are seers, they can peer into the future um, you know, anticipate uh, challenges of the day to anticipate the future. And for now, they are using their history of oppression to capture that moment. So this is the 21st century. We are going through the same challenges. What's wrong with our continent? That's what all writers should be seeking to comprehend. Where did we go wrong? Where did the rain start beating us? Um, we can, we can, we, we can, um, you know, think about all those possibilities. We have powerful moments uh, in our different countries to think about how land has been exploited by us and others, and how we can secure uh, or help, uh, you know, canvas for better policies that can secure the future of not just us, but the generations to come. So the length of the story, and uh, we have to remember uh, to return to this question again and again, the short form requires a lot of discipline because it's the most difficult to write. In 3000 words, you have everything that you, you need to say and it has to be said. So I don't think it's a, it, it's a few words though. Um, if Falele and Gogi are teaching us anything, <laughs> You don't even need uh, paragraphs to set up your story. Could be one sentence. So same way, you know, longer pieces of fiction will entice us with a hook. You can write very, very uh, economically and still do a great job in just highlighting um, a moment. We need to remember that uh, we, shall, we shall be expecting a seamless flow of our story it's up to the reader to be eavesdropping and hear where the story is going. And um, <clears throat> remember, readers are willing, readers are willing to work for their meal. They are willing to, to get to understand the story without being spoon fed. So uh, in other words, there won't be a moment when uh, we are posing to signal, and this is a, a vital part of the story, we expect them to be absorbed in it because they have been hooked from the beginning and then they'll be picking fragments to gain understanding of our stories. So what, 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 what we need to do to help us in the process is to make things clear enough. Uh, so how do we end our stories? So we know we have to resolve the central conflicts within a story. Unlike, uh, unlike um, you know, policy documents where <laughs> we say, in conclusion, we propose the following. One, uh, a special committee should be established to, um, to, to conduct comprehensive analysis of all the losses, the key beneficiaries and uh, their affiliations with the government. Three, the banks that were involved in uh, taking these assets. <laughs> if you try that, I mean, that's not how creative writing works because we use creative writing to highlight, you know, human conditions. And uh, through our, our stories, we, we deepen and extend our understanding of those phenomenon or those phenomena so that those who are working in that space can appreciate these, uh, these issues deeply. What I want us to do and uh, do it effectively is to use simple storylines to convey complex societal issues. 
And I think um, that's what we need to, uh, to recognize, that complex stories need not uh, be, be conveyed in complex plots. You can, you, can, you can let your characters perform those complex um, uh, moments in the story without signaling to the reader, this is a big deal, you better pay attention. It is going to emerge organically. It is your characters are going to, to problematize what you're writing about. So there is no simple, let me, let me, let me put it uh, very simply. There are no simple stories. There, there are complex characters who can perform important, important tasks within the story to lead us to a meaningful appreciation of the issue at hand. So uh, I, I, I think um, if you want to have a complex uh, analysis of society, your characters have to be immersed in, um, in uh, what they're doing, and then the reader can be sympathetic towards their pursuits and lead them to appreciate the larger issues that you're articulating. So POV, point of view. Uh, so you're going to choose um, how to narrate your story. So first person narrative like um, Falele um, ensures close proximity to your material. I left Nairobi on a bleak Saturday morning to pursue what became, you know, a nightmare of a lifetime. Well, it's a cliche, nightmares, but it is I. I have never known why we left Pretoria to go to the, to the country. So when I was aged five. So you, you know, uh, it's going to be an intimate portrait of a family. And the narrator is immersed in the pursuits of this family. I have never known. So, 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 so you know, it's going to be a, a revelatory journey. We're going to get, uh, we're going to, get to, uh, to comprehend these, these complex family dynamics. So if you use a, a third person, um, uh, what you call third person POV, they left or, or he left uh, Pretoria to return to his, um, uh, he has never known why he left, why he and his, and his siblings left Pretoria to go to uh, the country, um, uh, whatever duration. So, so you see, there is no intimacy when try third person. Uh, we, are, we are not inhabiting, um, we are not inhabiting that intimacy. We are, we are distanced somewhat. So, um, so, so, so if you choose to narrate from first, second or third a point of view, it will be determined largely by the proximity that you want to establish, the distance, literal distance between you and your material. So I, I, I do this myself. I write, um, I write different, uh, from different point of views. And then I try to uh, look at uh, the different uh, rhythms to, to my text and decide which is the most effective. So that's what I would uh, propose you all do. So if you're writing, um, you know, first or second or third person, uh, try uh, try a uh, vary uh, a few a few a few a few paragraphs, and see how it uh, how uh, how it reads. So. There will be limitations to each choice. So for instance, when you say, I'm writing in first person, that means you're not able to inhabit the minds of the other characters, all right? Uh, so I have never known why we left Pretoria to go to the country when I was aged five. So that means we cannot think, uh, we, we, we cannot get into the interior thoughts of these other characters. So it's a granny, um, we just see her silence. We see she doesn't smile. And then we are told she's, you know, um, big as a mountain or scary as a mountain or uh, whatever expressions Mfalele uses. So we're not able to inhabit uh, the interiority of the granny. But because the writer is so close to his material, first person works effectively. Ngugi, on the other hand, uses a uh, third person uh, point of view in Ripple of Child. And uh, he starts by a description. Um, 
uh, Nyokabi called him. Very simple um, uh, opening line. And then the description. She was a small woman. She was a small black woman with a bold but grave face. Um, and, and then we see her, her life you know, through the eyes. So you're going to choose your own uh, point of view based on what you're narrating. So what I've seen um, so far is that uh, one can never tell until they put it down on the page. And if one point of view is not working very effectively, um, you can write a short passage in a different mode and just see how it feels. I just want to thank uh, my brother, Professor Peter Kimani, for a fantastic journey. Um, it's always very enriching. Um, and we never stop learning. This is um, the truth. I mean, we never stop learning. So let's keep learning. Let's keep improving each other. Let's build the community of writers. Um, and, and, and of course, as, as we say, it, a land really drives Africa in so many ways. And I think there is um, an opportunity for us to look at land as a, uh, as a resource for our imagination, not just because of the landscapes uh, and the, you know, the diversity that the continent has, but also in the ways in which land drives our politics, drives our social interaction, drives conflict, uh, drives all sorts of things. But of course, as uh, Peter said, let us go for the story uh, so that those big issues are um, uh, told rather creatively, other than um, as if we are in a church sermon. Creativity in all domains of life, whether those domains are in governance, in urbanization, in all sorts of things, Creativity needs to be visible. And I think that uh, you are very creative people and you have this amazing uh, opportunity to shift the discourse um, on, you know, on the role of arts um, and so on uh, in, in, in a very creative way. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I have myself enjoyed uh, the course. I was very quiet uh, out of fear of any, saying anything that makes absolutely no sense. Um, but it was it, it was relatable. I mean, even even for me, uh, there was a lot to draw from and to learn, and it was broken enough down for 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 somebody like me. So I just want to thank you, Professor Kemani, for that. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we have all drawn inspiration from the course and uh, gained a few tips as well that will really help to improve the stories but for those who are starting to write also to start writing new stories and um and i hope that uh, you'll be inspired to continue even beyond the conference writing about uh, issues that pertain to land and also are challenging um those that are in positions that uh that allow them to do better because i think that we are in my view we are not hearing enough stories um of of the you know just the, the 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 issues that continue to to really affect so so many people and and we maybe maybe the stories are in another in another space but i i don't know whether they are enough and so we need to look at having the stories in very many different uh media so that we are able to reach even those that um, that that may not, you know, even even with humor or with whatever it is, but we are able to reach those that uh, either are affected or uh, can relate or can do something about it. And so I'm looking forward to that. And I know that is not mainly you are, you know, you're not you're not writing with that purpose necessarily. You're writing uh, because you want to tell a story. Uh, but I'm hoping that in the context of writing that story, the message does fall on the right ears.